Hi, everybody. This is Hondo Carpenter, your Las Vegas Raiders beat writer for Sports Illustrated and the host of the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. It's really terrific to be with you today. Thank you for joining me. I hope you're excited. It's, we're coming into a going to be a great weekend going into 4th of July week. I know a lot of people, both inside the NFL and fans outside the NFL, are looking forward to slowing things down a little bit and relaxing and just enjoying some time. And, and you know what? That's great. And it's wonderful. And I hope that you're getting to have it. If you're not, I hope it's something that at least later in the summer, or maybe you've already had it, but I just hope that you are excited about your time. Football's getting closer. You can almost smell that chlorophyll from the freshly cut grass rising up like an incense saying, okay, the fields are freshly manicured. It's time for football. Let's go. Summer's behind us. Let's go. I, I know if you're from the North Country, which is where I'm from, uh, you're thinking, no, 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 because summer is so short. Don't get us into football season yet. And But if you're a true football fan, I know what your heart's thinking. All right, let's go. It's been a long, long off season. Let's play some football. And we're getting there, and it's close. And really, especially in the National Football League and even in college football, after the 4th of July is when guys really just, you know, they come out of mandatory mini camp, a little bit of a break there. And then after 4th of July is when their focus just goes to football. So a lot of good stuff um, coming up and uh, excited to talk ball with you today. I want to quickly remind you, you can find me on IG at Hondo SR and on X formerly known as Twitter at Hondo Carpenter at Hondo Carpenter. I want to get into um, something really important today that I think is important for fans to digest and for fans to make part of their understanding. I have said this numerous times before, but it bears repeating um, because of today's broadcast. One of the things that has always appealed to me about Raider Nation is the same thing I find fascinating about St. Louis Cardinals fans in baseball, uh, Nebraska Cornhusker fans in football, Indiana uh, Hoosier fans in uh, college basketball, Laker fans in the NBA, um, and uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, Detroit Red Wing fans in hockey, is they are very knowledgeable fan base very knowledgeable. They know the game. They understand the game. They just don't go to the game because it's a production. They go to the game because they love it. They enjoy the nuances of it. I think I've shared this story before, but I remember early on um, in on the Raiders beat, um, I was approached uh, at a grocery store in Henderson by an older lady Um and when I say older, I'm, I'm going to guess she was in her 80s. Um, and we were just talking about the Raiders. And she was so excited because she had moved from Southern California to Vegas at retirement. And her and her husband would go down to Raider games. And they were season ticket holders before the move. But she's, they would go down to a lot of games. And they were just thrilled the Raiders were coming. And, and so excited. And she starts breaking down with me the cover two defense. And how she thinks that the you know the Raiders, uh, how much it would benefit them to expand that a little bit. And as I'm standing there in the aisle of the grocery store, it, it I thought you know this is so cool. This is why I wanted to cover this team. It is fun to cover a football team as a beat writer for people who understand um, what you're giving. I'm going to give you a very quick analogy. I have certain foods that I really like and certain foods that I don't like. And I was in a situation one time where I was in, uh, going to be eating food as a guest. Um, that was not something I greatly cared for. And uh, I remember a person saying to me, oh, this is going to be miserable for you. And I looked at him and goes, you know what? You have 21 meals a week three day 
And if having one of food that I'm not the greatest and most fond of, you know, if I can't get through that because it's not my norm, then what's wrong with me as an adult? I said, no, I'm not concerned about it at all. And I went, had the meal. My expectation was, I, I want to try it. I want to, I don't know. And I'm, I do I think I'm going to like it? No, because I, I don't necessarily like that. But for one meal, who cares? And I was able to go and enjoy it and enjoy the company and had a great visit. Did I like the food? No, but the food didn't make the evening palatable. The company and all of the evening made the night palatable. Who cares about a meal? I'm, here's where I'm going with this. Sometimes when you have a fan base that doesn't understand things, it they, it's very difficult because when you try to explain things, that's just an excuse or that's just whatever. And that is one thing of which I have great appreciation for you, Raider Nation, because Raider Nation is really smart. Now, where am I going with today's broadcast? There are some key things that when you have covered something for a long time that you know that you've learned, that you've seen. And it's important as a reporter. Now, remember, the way I approach being a beat writer is my job is to be your eyes and ears inside that building. Now, not just literally physically in it, although that's a big part, but in it being connected with people, being trustworthy and honorable, and being a person that's able to get information and then processing it and then sometimes it's okay is this information that the fan base has to have sometimes you learn things that you're like mm. no and you put that on a shelf yep here's something that's very important very important to uh, get into and we're going to get into this today because there are three things three observations that i have made about winning sports teams and these are three things that they all have in common. Every single one of them. They all have it. And when you are able to step back and rather than look at things under a microscope, which is super close, but step back and look at things macroly, bird's eye view, then you see things differently. And these are three vital things that over my many, many years of covering, I've covered Major League Baseball and, and NHL hockey and football, college basketball, pro basketball, college football. This is three things that I have seen from every championship team. Three things. And we're going to get into those today. And then it's going to be up to you to determine if you think this Raiders team possesses those three things. And then I'll tell you what I think when we get to the end. All right, so let's get going here. The very first thing I want to talk about is championship teams. And this is what the Raiders are building towards. Understand the moment. Now, you may ask yourself, what's he talking about? I mean, of course they understand. They're in a stadium with 70,000 people. That's not what I'm talking about. The moment. They understand that football games are won on just a couple of really crucial plays. Football games are won in, in just moments. Literally something will happen. I want to go back to last year. You may remember Jack Jones jumped the play, made an unbelievable interception for a touchdown. Now, let me go back and paint the picture for you behind the scenes. Jack Jones watched a ton of film, a ton of it. In fact, that week, someone had referenced to me how much of a film watcher he was. And in my reporting, I made a comment about um, um, prior to the reporting about, you know, Jack Jones and how well he was playing and you know whatever and watching a lot of film. 
So he's in a formation. He's lined up. And there's a formation that the Raiders had seen. And they knew what was coming. The kind of pass it was going to be whatever. Jack notices it. Hey, this is something that we we, we were on, we watched on film all week. Patrick Graham had had drilled this into the team, and he's really good about reading and understanding. The play goes off. Jack makes his move, goes up, makes an unbelievable interception, and runs it in for a touchdown. He understood the moment. There's going to be a lot of plays in a football game that don't do anything. There's going to be a lot of plays in Raiders games this year that really eh, didn't matter. But when you miss the moments, maybe you're a defender and the team drives all the way down the field, all the way down the field to score a winning touchdown. But the moment of your preparation, it's often said like this, when inspiration meets perspiration you end up with jubilation so when you're inspired you've done you you know you're ready to go you're in great shape you've eaten right you've taken care of your body you're inspired you're jacked up you're fired up let's go <laughs> when inspiration then meets preparation you've watched the film you've lifted the weight You've done everything you can do to prepare for that moment. And then Jack Jones lines up <clears throat> and reads it. He reads it. Boom, makes a huge interception, scores a touchdown. Touchdown. What if he had made a bad play, the, the play before, and he's still pouting? What if he had made a great play the moment before, and he's still celebrating? And by not being focused, he missed a moment. I know a lot of people think this is oversimplification. And I am telling you, and I assure you, it's not. In each game, there are moments. And I, I heard it said this way one time. Uh, after a Rose Bowl win, a winning Rose Bowl coach made the comment, football is a game of just a couple of inches. How many times have you seen a team on a drive and they go forward and forth down and they finish a couple of inches away from the first down marker and the other team gets the ball back? Game over. Football is a game of inches. It's played on a 100-yard field, and the reason they measure is because it's a game of inches. Sometimes, you know, a quarterback has a 12-inch window. Sometimes it's a nine inch window and he may have a receiver who's just barely open, but the difference between a great quarterback and a good quarterback is the great quarterback doesn't need a 12 inch window. He's got a nine inch window. It's a moment. I tell people all the time that most people do not understand how closely matched all the teams in the NFL are. There are few bottom feeders, and we know that. But the teams that consistently win the most win the moment. They win the moment. I want to give you some more examples of this. Um, Marcus Peters. Now, I want to say this right up front because I said it when he got here, and I said it when he left. Marcus Peters, emotional guy, incredibly talented. Jack Jones, emotional guy, incredibly talented. Both men had made some really good plays. But what stood out to me between the two of them was Jack Jones understood the moment. He got it. He got it. He understood that. Inspiration with perspiration, meaning I'm putting the work in. You can be inspired, but if you're not inspired to put the work in, it's not going to happen. Leads to jubilation. 
But I'm going to also tell you, inspiration without perspiration leads to frustration. And one of the things that I noticed about Marcus Peters is when other people had a moment, he struggled with it sometimes. Struggled with it. And it would stick with him. And in the NFL, you want guys that have a very short memory. Here's why. You may make a great play, and you're excited, and you're jumping around, and you're jacked up. Nothing wrong with that. Football's a game of emotion. But when the next play starts, they're still not all there, and they miss a moment. Or they make a bad play, and they're so mad. They're mad at a ref. They're mad at themselves, whatever. Next play, one play leads to two bad plays. You've heard me say that a lot. Got to have a short memory. You can't let one play, good or bad, impact the next play. It's it, You have to compartmentalize. And the championship teams that understand the moment compartmentalize. They can have a great first quarter, and then they don't live off the laurels. They have a great second quarter. Here's another example. How many times have you heard me mention you got to put your foot on the gas and can't take it off? That was something that when Josh McDaniels was the coach, um, all the way through. And remember, <clears throat> I give them 20 games. But all the way through with him, I would say they got to put their foot on the gas. You can't get a big lead and then be different. And you'll understand why that in a moment. But it's important to understand the moment. It's understand um, how you're going to do something, how you're going to be there. Okay. Another example. I grew up in Michigan and, and was a, I'm not the biggest baseball guy anymore, but I used to be a very big baseball fan. Okay. And the Detroit Tigers were one pitcher away from being a world series team. You could tell it, um, you as a fan, and I watched every single game, and you could tell, you know, oh man, if they just had that that extra pitcher, you knew it. You could even though I'm not, I don't claim to be in a baseball aficionado. You could tell it. Everybody talked about it. I remember watching us sitting in in you know in the Tiger Stadium with my dad, and you know he would. Him and I talk about, we just need one pitcher. Notice I said, we, why? I was a fan. So the Tigers trade a guy in their, in their farm system named Johnny Smoltz. And y'all know who he is, Hall of Famer. By the way, wonderful person, wonderful person, great guy, wonderfully great guy. Um, from Michigan, um, nobody at that time knew who, you know, that he was going to be the Johnny Smoltz that's in the Hall of Fame today. He had, you know, been in Waverly High School in the Lansing, Michigan area. And, you know, everyone, you know, knew him as a high school player. He'd done so well. And there's a big high school baseball tournament in mid-Michigan called the Diamond Classic. And people in Michigan knew who he was. But he wasn't a, a, a figure that even the people in Michigan thought this guy was going to be who he was. But the Raiders, Raiders, the Tigers knew they were one pitcher away. So they make a trade with Atlanta for a veteran pitcher by the name of Dole Alexander. And Dole comes in and was phenomenal. He was not good. He was phenomenal. The Tigers went on and won the World Series with him. Now, Johnny Smoltz goes on and has an amazing career. And uh, by the way, remind me sometime, I'll tell you a wonderful Johnny Smoltz story. And But John goes on, has an amazing career, and does really well with Atlanta. Obviously, you all know that. That's factual. Years later, the, the big topic of conversation was the Tigers should have never traded Johnny Smoltz, to which my answer was always, they knew the moment, they made the trade, they won a World Series. Had they made the trade and not won the World Series, I would have agreed it would have been a dumb move. But the leadership of the Tigers at the time understood the moment. They understood the moment. Baseball is about winning World Series. The NFL is about winning Super Bowls. 
And so you have to understand the moment. That's why as a leader, you have to understand as a quarterback, okay, is this where I take my shot down the field or an offensive coordinator or a head coach? Or do I wait? No, I'm, I'm staying on the moment because this is so vitally important. And remember, this is all relative to the Raiders. Years ago, I had a particular coach say to me, we are going to run a play multiple times that everyone is going to be extremely critical of us for running, but we're setting it up because we think this game is going to be super close. And in the fourth quarter, we're going to run a different play out of this formation. And we believe that the defense is going to be like, oh, okay, great, great, great. We, we've stopped this play four or five times before. So they run this play the first time, it fails. Second play, fans go on and it fails. Fans are on Twitter. I never want to see that play again. Never want to see that formation again. They do it a third time. Oh, that's ridiculous. That's stupid. This is dumb. Who puts this play in? Fire the coach. Fire the, you know how they are. So the team gets to the fourth quarter and they need to score to win. They line up in this formation. I mean, fans in the stadium are booing. Social media is exploding. They line up. The defense, you could see them all pointing where the play is going. Everybody shifts to where that play had gone because it was a unique formation. And the play goes the opposite way. And the guy literally could have walked into the end zone. And the crowd goes wild. The coach understood the moment. Sometimes you have to set the moment up. Sometimes you have to set it up the moment in ways that people don't realize what's coming. That's the scheming part of football. But you have to understand the moment. How many times have you heard me say great general managers have told me you can't win a Super Bowl in March, April, May, June, whatever, but you can lose one. It's understanding the moment. Now, I want to go in and I want to um, address one more thing when it comes to the moment. Actually, two things, but this is still very much important to the Raiders because these are things that you're going to understand as the Raiders continue to grow. You're going to begin to really understand this is what good teams do. So years ago, um, I heard a coach explain it to this way. You don't want to let the lion out of the cage. You don't want the trash talk, you know, before the game. He used to tell his players. When you're being interviewed by the press, remember, that's a great team. They're a good team. We respect them. Whatever. Keep the emotion in the cage. In that particular week, the opposing team, uh, which was a very good football team, had made a lot of really um, locker room material, bulletin board material type comments. And this one team just kept their mouth shut. They were they were not favored to win. That team totally all week would tell me off the record, oh, we're going to win. We're going to whoop them. And the coach just kept telling his team, keep the line in the cage, keep the line in the cage, keep the line in the cage, understand the moment. But when you step on the field, then you unleash it. So the two teams get on the field. One team had been talking all week. One team had not. And during warm-ups, you could just sense something different. They go out for pregame meeting with the captains. You could just sense something different. First play of the game, you could sense something different. The other team had been jacked up all week. They had, they had spent all of their emotion. The other team just kept theirs. Just kept it. They just kept it. Until they got on the field. And they let the lion out of the cage. They understood the moment. They got the moment. Then a moment made sense to them. And that's number one. First thing about being a championship team is you have to understand the moment. If you're Tom Telesco and you're thinking about a trade, okay, is this person young enough that he's going to be part of a foundation going forward? 
Is he an older in the tooth veteran that I'm just trading for this year? Cause I think we're close and can win it. Is he a player that I can trade for cheap enough that he fills a need this year, but I get to move on from him next year and go draft somebody. And the cost of getting him for the need is negligent. You have to understand the moment. Um, in the past, I don't believe that the Raiders always did this. There were time that they would times that they would go sign players who were big names, but weren't in their prime, which I'm not against signing those guys because they still can do a certain thing. Those of you who are old, and old enough, remember, Charles Haley was a really good pass rusher. There were other things in his game that he did not do well, but at the end of his career, he was still a, an exceptional pass rusher. So you bring in a guy like that, and your role is to just pass rush. Just as you do that, okay? There's nothing wrong with hiring a an, an long-in-the-tooth veteran if you understand who they are. But so Tom Telesco has to understand, okay, what's my moment? Do I think I'm three years away from being a Super Bowl contender? Do I think I'm two years away? Then you have to look at your salary cap. Okay, now last year, the appearance – was that the Chargers had a lot of veterans. They had a lot of money. Their salary crap was really tight, the way it was focused. Okay, last year was a year that they took a shot. Didn't work. Took the shot. You have to understand your moment. You have to understand, okay, is this my moment that I go from A to B? Or is this my moment I go from A to B, but C's my Super Bowl? Or Z's my Super Bowl? And I'm going from A to B. Now, this is where I talked about if the Raiders were rebuilding, Devontae Adams would not have still been on this roster. He is certainly still in his prime. I am in no way saying he's a long-on-the-tooth veteran. That is not, I think he's the best wide receiver in the NFL. But my my point was, is if that if they were going to rebuild, you would have traded him and moved him, picked up all those additional draft picks, to or players in order to rebuild but they made the decision we're not rebuilding here we got a lot of pieces to compete now so that's why Devonte wasn't going anywhere it's understanding the moment now do i think the raiders are a super bowl team in 2024 absolutely not i don't feel that way at all do i think they're improved i do do i think they're a playoff team i do to me i've already reported this I think the, the floor is nine wins, ceiling 11 in the regular season. So if you get to 10 or 11, you're going to be probably be in the playoffs. So I think they're a team that's on that cusp, closer to the playoffs than not. And they understood the moment. Great teams, great general managers, great quarterbacks, great players, they understand the moment. I'm going to tell you somebody who was phenomenal at this was Brett Favre. Brett understood the moment. He understood, I'm going to take this shot. I have a very good friend who played for Brett. And you may say, well, what do you mean? Brett wasn't a coach. Yeah. But there were the guys who played with Brett Favre played for him. They played with him and they played for him. They loved him. And he used to say to me, all right, boys, this is where we're going to break their back. Here we go. And he just knew. Or, or he would look and say to a guy, I'm throwing the ball. You better get open. But this is the moment. I'm throwing you the ball. And he'd throw it. Somehow, some way, those receivers would get the ball and make the play. Great players know the moment. Now, I want to go back here. Rich Gannon was one of those guys who understood moments. In Rich's defense, I, thought, I think there was a lot of time. Not everybody around him understood it. But he did. And there were times that you watched Rich Gannon play. And it was very evident. When you find those players that understand moments, it is a place of maturity in a player that it's very hard for young guys to get there. It just takes time. But when you get enough moment, guys, you win. The Raiders got some of them. I'm not convinced they have enough of them. 
but they have some of them. That's why I think they're they're going to get in the playoffs, be right there. And I think they've got some young guns coming who are going to be. That's why I think the future is so bright. All right, next. Preparation. Um, I re got two examples of this I want to give you because we're talking about what makes a championship team. What makes a franchise with sustainable success? Years ago, I was interviewing Bobby Knight, and I asked him about the will to win. And uh, he, you know, I'm trying to remember now. I may not have been the one to ask the question. I think I was, but I may not have been. It's been so long. I, I, I think I was, but I may not have been. But I was there and question you know about the will to win and i'll never forget he looked at me this is what makes me think i asked it because i remember specifically him looking at me but i know of times he looked at me and i didn't ask the question that's where i'm juxtaposed and he said will the win will the win and i'm going to clean it up a little bit but that's the dumbest blankety blank thing i've ever heard who wants to lose how many people go to Vegas and say, oh, man, I, I really want to win and walk out broke? Now, I wasn't in Vegas at the time. So it was a great analogy. He goes, you know, how many guys you know, want to do X, want to do Y? They have the will to do it. They don't do it. And I'll never forget him explaining how the will to win meant nothing. He goes, what I want. Our guy, and I, I actually think the question was, how do you find players with the will to win? If I, if I remember correctly, that was the exact question. But he goes, I don't look at those. And he began to talk about recruiting. And he wanted to go watch kids in practice more than watch them in the game. And he talked about, by the time I go see him, we already know what they're doing in games. We already know they're good players. I want to go to practice and see, do they have the will to prepare to win? He said that, and I'll never forget that as long as I live. He talked about, I don't care what it is in life, basketball, husband, dad. Do you have the will to prepare to win? Preparation. Remember we talked about inspiration, the will to win. Without perspiration. The will to prepare to win equals jubilation. And I thought that was one of the most brilliant things that I've ever heard from Bobby Knight. Um, several times a year, I'll give uh, speeches or um, addresses to people will bring me in to, as a motivational speaker or they'll bring me in to speak at things. And certainly not all the time, but oftentimes I, I ask you know, when you look in the mirror, do you have the will to prepare to win? Do you have that? Is it there with you? Is it always there with you? Do you have the will to prepare to win? I'm asked a lot. Why do you do a podcast every day, 365 days a year? Um, I had someone say to me, you know, geez, oh, Pete's in the slow summer months. Are you going to take some time off? No. No. If I want Raider Nation to trust me as your beat writer, I'm going to be there every day. I'm going to prepare to be the best. That's my opinion. Some people are really super good at it and don't have to do it. That's not a slam on them. This is about Hondo. It's about understanding preparation for me. It's about understanding that, yeah, there's moments, but then there's also prep. And you have to be that way. Now, let me use Antonio Pierce as an example. I think this is this is uh, huge. You may remember the New York Giants are going up against the New England Patriots. It is a game in which very few people were even giving the Giants a chance. It was, this is the greatest football team in history. It was the Tom Brady team. And I, they had all the great players. And this is the best football team in history. Nobody was giving them a chance. Now I learned this from some of AP's teammates. 
teammate AP doesn't run around and brag on himself. So AP picks up some stuff on film about Tom Brady. He takes it to his coaches who see it as well. That was not a staff. We're the coaches. You're the players. Shut up. No, that was a staff. That's a lot like the staff AP's building now. In fact, this is something that should excite Raider Nation. AP is building a staff right now along those same lines. He wants a staff that's listening to players, players that listen to staff. He wants that harmonious team. And the, and the, and the Giants had it. Giants had it. And he goes and he points out some things. They see it. There's agreement. They make adjustments. And in, in what many believe was the greatest upset in Super Bowl history, many people believe even bigger than Joe Namus. Win. They won a Super Bowl. Because AP was prepared. Because he was dialed in. Every year, if a Super Bowl's in Vegas or New Orleans or wherever it is, you know, you'll hear of a player doing something stupid. You know, to them, it's just, woo, party, let's go. Then there are some guys that understand, no, preparation. I remember one team, and 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 I don't have permission to tell this, so I'm not going to tell what team. But I remember one time at a Super Bowl, somebody I was very close with was part of this one team. And um, they said, you know, the coach said, I'm not going to give you a bunch of rules because then the rules get out to the media, and it looks like you guys are a bunch of undisciplined blanks. He said, here's the deal. If you came here for a vacation, you came here for the wrong reasons. I don't believe that we've got guys on this team that came here for a vacation. I think you all understand the moment. If you win tomorrow, you will be remembered forever as a world champion. And he just said to him, I'm not giving you a bunch of rules. I'm not giving you bedtimes. Not doing that. I expect you to be grown men, to understand the moment. Why do I care if you get in at 10 or 11 because you're out to dinner with your family or, you know, having a good time and just enjoying yourself in a, in a professional manner? Why? Why do I care? If I think you're guys that are mature enough to understand the moment and you've prepared, and they went on, on and that was a big win. And I remember later, um, asking several people about it and there was a guy on that team that was probably not the most responsible and I had a chance to talk to that guy years later and I said I was told the coach did this he goes it did and I said so how did you handle that because he was older now and mature and he said yeah I'll tell you exactly what happened first time in my life somebody had really looked at me and said grow up and he goes and the fact he didn't have the rules, a couple of my teammates were like, wow. And he's like, I didn't want to let my coach know. See, that preparation, that understanding of the moment, AP understood the moment of that Super Bowl. Hey, they are a great team. And I think you can make the argument. I think you can make the argument. Unequivocally, that was one of the best football teams ever assembled in the modern NFL. But they ain't got the Super Bowl trophy. AP does. And that's how he's building the Raiders. It's how he's developing the Raiders. And it's how he's trying to develop the mindset. Now, now follow me for one last moment because I got another key point here about AP. That is why you'll see some fans, you know, the Raiders are never going to be able to score enough points to keep up with the Chiefs. Okay. I see that argument. I don't think it's germane, and here's why. The Chiefs got hit pretty hard by the Raider defense. You, If you remember, and if you DVR'd it, go back and watch it. Remember the game last year at Allegiant Stadium? And Raiders had that game. The Raiders... Let the Chiefs win that game. Now, that's not disrespectful of the Chiefs. Shouldn't matter if a team let you win or you went out and took it. A win is a win. You don't apologize for it. They go to Arrowhead. 
just a couple weeks later. And the Raiders knew. Hey, we let that last one go away. We're better than them. We can beat them. And they played a tremendously disciplined game and got a big win on Christmas Day. <clears throat> That's where the Raiders are coming from. We don't have to go out and score 50 points. We're going to build an amazing defense that punches them in the face, that doesn't let them score as many points as they're used to. And we want a defense, an offense that doesn't turn the ball over, that can take their shots downfield because they got weapons, but can run the football, eat the clock. See, I think they're I, I think Raiders should be solely Chiefs focused. Solely in their mind. It's all about beating the Chiefs. They're the Super Bowl champions. They're your AFC West champions. To be the man, to quote Ric Flair, you got to beat the man. And so to be solely focused there. But the difference is <clears throat> you don't have to play Kansas City's game if you play yours. Now, where's that come from? AP beating Tom Brady. They knew they were not going to go out and play offense. And the first one to 50 wins, Giants first, Patriots in the Super Bowl. They did not have all the plethora of weapons, nor as talented of weapons <clears throat> as the Patriots. They knew they didn't have to. They knew how the defense was going to play, <clears throat> which was a dominant defensive line that you didn't have to blitz a lot. So you may have four rushers, seven defensive backs. That's what happened on Christmas Day last year. And the Raiders are better. So that's the mindset. Remember, the first one is understanding the moments. The second one is preparation. <clears throat> and the last one I want to talk about is being true to yourself. Great teams understand we've got to be us. Now, this is where I don't think Antonio Pierce gets enough credit. There have been some Raider teams in the past that I felt like their mentality, I, I, some of it I felt, some of it I knew, the mentality is, we got to outscore the Chiefs. AP's mentality is, that's not who we are. We're not a 50-point-a-game team. Now, clearly they have some games where they got it there. Clearly they had some games they put no points on the board. But he knew who they were. He knew who they were. And the point was, be who you are. Understand who you are. And great teams understand their identity. They're very comfortable in their own skin. Let me give you two great examples of this. Eli Manning and Peyton Manning. I think you can make a lot of arguments that if you were naming the top five quarterbacks of all time, Peyton Manning would be one of those. I think you could make an argument. I'm not saying that he is a shoe in I'm not saying he's not a shoe in I just think you could have a lively discussion. Eli understood. Mm. I may not be able to do things the way Peyton does. But I know who I am. And one of the things about Eli Manning that I have always respected about him, and I, by the way, I respect both of them. Good men, good guys, great football players, great guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whole Manning family are just salt of the earth people. But Eli didn't ever try to be Peyton. He was very content in his own skin beating Eli. And oh, by the way, Eli has two Super Bowls, the same as Peyton. Oh, <clears throat> and he has two MVPs, Super Bowl MVPs. He never tried to be who he wasn't. He didn't go out and do five million audibles. Nothing wrong with that if you're Peyton. But Eli was Eli. He wasn't going to cost them the game. He was very safe with the football. He was very prepared. He, he, he knew he watched a ton of film. He knew it all. He wasn't the biggest guy in the world. 
Neither was Peyton, but I'm just saying he when when he looked at other guys, he wasn't trying to be anyone else. He just wanted to be Eli. And he understood if I'm Eli, if I'm just Eli, we're going to be okay because I'm good and I belong here. <clears throat> How does this apply to the Raiders? They believe that there is a lot of Eli in Aiden O'Connell. Have they seen enough to know that? No. But they've seen enough to go, ooh, there's a lot of Eli in him. Now, it is up to Aiden to grow and develop and to become that to become that, but he has to be true to himself. Does Aiden need to have more mobility? Yes. Does he have to run like Patrick Mahomes for the Raiders to win? No. They need to see him do a little bit of lateral. They need to be able to see him do a little bit of horizontal, a little bit of vertical. <clears throat> Talking about mobility. And we know he can do that. Go back and watch his Purdue film. And oh, by the way, watching him this offseason. It had been drilled in him for the first half of last year. Stay in the pocket, 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 stay in the pocket. And all of a sudden it's okay, you can move a little bit. And, and that's all part of having two offensive coordinators before your first year is over. And now he's into his third and hasn't played one game in his second season. Mm -hmm. But they knew. And so the Raiders were like, okay, there's a lot of different ways to win football games. And you see people who they look at the Chiefs, and let me tell you something. I have immense respect for the Chiefs. Best quarterback in the NFL, and I think they have the best coach in the NFL. There's a ton of respect there. But it doesn't mean the only way to win in the NFL is to win like the Chiefs. There are lots of teams that can ground it and pound it. A lot of teams that can be super balanced. Then there are a lot of teams that can be, you know, very heavy. A lot of teams that put a lot of money on offense, a lot of money on defense. Some that try to stay pretty balanced. The point of the matter is, is good teams are true to themselves. Let me ask you this question, Raider Nation. And you're smart. This is what I love about Raider Nation. Does it matter to you if you beat the Chiefs 55-54? Or if you beat them 24-17, isn't the motto just win? Would you rather lose 55-54 or win 24-21? Now, I believe because Raider Nation and their football IQ being as high as it is, I know that that's a dumb question. You're probably thinking that is the dumbest question, Hondo, you moron. Of course it'd be the win. So when you understand the moment, when you understand the preparation, and then you understand being true to yourself. So I'm going to um, tell a story. Um. I'm going to tell it this way. Trent Dilfer <clears throat> with a Baltimore Raven team that had a dominating defense, very balanced offensive attack, won a Super Bowl. And people call him a game manager. They talk him down. Well, they won in spite of Trent Dilfer. Well, I know people who were on that team. Not one of them thinks they won in spite of him. How many guys from that team have you talked to if you think he's just, just a game manager? I've talked to a bunch of them. <clears throat> I remember one guy in particular telling me um, it was at a social function, so it wasn't on the record. I don't think he would care if I told you, but I'm not going to tell you who just because it was a social function. But him saying to me, it was at a wedding for a mutual friend, uh, he goes, you know what really ticks me off? Because he knew I was a media guy and we were talking about media. They write about Trent. 
Oh, he's just a game manager. He goes, we wouldn't have won without him. Other guys would have made passes that got intercepted. He just he, he didn't take a ton of risks. He did exactly what our coaches wanted him to do, and he won them. Because why? Why are you guys so disrespectful of Trent Dilfer? And I remember saying to him, hey, back off. I've never been disrespectful of Trent Dilfer. Raider Nation, let me ask you a question, then. As you watched the Chiefs win a Super Bowl in your stadium last year, would you have rather been there with a game manager and won it? Or would you have rather watched a non-game manager and Patrick Mahomes win it in your stadium? Well, we all know the answer. Being true to yourself. I've got one more story here, but I think these are important. I'm not just telling stories because it's story time with Uncle Hondo. I'm telling you these because I'm trying to help you to develop a mindset that understands it. And I'm going to wrap it all up together with a nice little bowl. Years ago, the Michigan State Spartans went down to the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas, and they were taking on the Baylor Bears. Art Bryles was the coach. If you're old enough, you can remember they had a dominating offense. It was just a blistering good offense. It was one of the best offenses I've ever watched play uh, in college football. Hear the emphasis on offenses and just, I, I was not impressed with several areas of that team, but I was very impressed with their offense. And during the week, the Michigan State coaches, and they, they had a very good football team, very good football team. Um, I think their lack of creativity and their lack of attacking on offense kept them from being great. But they had a very good football team. They had a guy that ended up being a Raiders quarterback in Connor Cook, who was not a good pro, but was a phenomenal college quarterback. Phenomenal. And in watching film of Baylor, they knew that they won the mental game almost every week. Their offense would come out and explode, get a big lead, and the other teams would just kind of almost fold. Well, we'll never catch them now. They scored 30 points in the first quarter. That means they're going to you know, score 120 in this game. And the Michigan State coaches, specifically their head coach, made it clear to the team, there's going to come a point in this game because they have a great defense that they're going to begin to celebrate. They're not going to understand this is a full 60-minute game. And when that happens, you need to be excited because once they start celebrating, they get very loose and nobody's ever that season continued to punch them in the face. And the Michigan State coaches told the players, Pat Narduzzi was, uh, who's now the coach of Pittsburgh, was the defensive coordinator on that team. And they said, listen, they're very good. They're going to score points. We know that. But we're going to keep delivering haymakers to their face. And we're going to play 60 minutes. And if you do, you will beat them. They just hammered that into the Michigan State team. I mean, every day, multiple times. They just hammered them, 60 minutes. When they start to celebrate, then we'll know we're going to win. So here comes the game. It's on national TV. Baylor's blowing out Michigan State. They run this place, this incredible play on the goal line. They got a huge defensive tackle. Oakman, I believe, was his name. This huge defensive tackle goes, catches it. I think he caught a pass. He didn't, I don't think he ran it. I think he caught it. And you look, and the entire Baylor sideline is partying and dancing and celebrating like they just won the game. Now, I love emotion, and I love watching guys celebrate. But remember I talked about being in the moment, coming back, and not letting one play affect the next one? Baylor couldn't do that. And Michigan State coaches had explained to the players, once they get to that place of euphoria, they're going to turn it off. And you're going to keep punching them in the face. And when they realize, oh, my God, the game's not over. These guys are still playing. It's going to be too late because you can't turn it on and turn it off. You got to it's all got to be on. That's why I don't like it when coaches play not to lose. The only thing that happens when you play not to lose is lose. You play to win the football game. 
So during all of their celebration, you looked over to the Michigan State sideline. <clears throat> and all you saw was the Spartans celebrating. Pointing over to the Baylor sideline. Now, in fairness, the Michigan State fans were like, but the team and those people like myself who were close to the team saw exactly. In fact, I put it out there. I reported it. If you saw the Michigan State sideline after the blast Baylor touchdown, I'm paraphrasing. This isn't a quote. They're going to come back and win. I put that right on social media. And I talked about it. So here comes Michigan State. They just kept pounding them. Next play, because Baylor still is like, who cares? We're up big. <clears throat> We've blown these guys out. They don't score. They don't score. Michigan State defense just kept playing tough, punching them in the face. And all of a sudden, get down to the end of the ball game, Michigan State scores the winning score, and they win the game. Now, the national audience stunned. I, I cannot tell you, hundreds of people, I turned the game off. Okay. Michigan State, the little, little engine that could, they just kept playing. They played a full 60 minutes and won it because they were true to themselves. Now, follow me, please. This is really important. The Raiders go out and can't score one touchdown to win a game. Then go out and set a franchise record for points. Why? because they were true to themselves. They understood one game doesn't define us. This is a 17 game season. Nobody is going to go undefeated. And it's moments. It's being true to yourself. Would the Raiders love to score 55 points a game? Yes. Do I think they're a team that next year will score 55 points a game? No, but they know who they are. Great teams understand the moment. Great teams understand the preparation to get to the moment. So precious. And then third, th the third thing is great teams understand. I don't have to be the Chiefs. I've got to beat the Chiefs. Got to be true to who I am. We hope this has been a help for you today. This is all what you're seeing Antonio Pierce build towards. This is all the direction. That's why I wanted to take time, and I know this has been lengthy, but explain to you, they don't need Aiden to be Patrick Mahomes. But guess what? Patrick Mahomes eats up a ton of the salary cap. They're paying him a bundle of money, and he's worth every dime of it. They don't have to pay Aiden that. He's still on a fourth round first contract because that's not what they ask him to be. The Raiders understand who they are. The fans maybe don't always understand. They don't care if it's pretty. They just want to win. Some people would rather lose pretty than win ugly. Al Davis said, just win, baby. I have one thing I want to address, and I'm going to let you go. I have no idea why this is. Maybe it's because I'm a public figure and we talk a lot like this. But I got a bunch of email asking me to comment about the presidential debate. And that makes no sense to me. I want to make it very clear. Politics are very important to me and they should be to all of us. It's our country. But this is not what this format is for. I don't discuss politics. Not because I don't have opinions and not because I don't care and not because it's not important to me. People come to Hondo Carpenter to talk football, to talk and, and what this is. When I turn on a program, maybe it's football, maybe it's something else. If I want to listen to someone talk about politics, I'll turn on politics. That's not what this is. And I... I want to make it real clear. Don't send me the emails. I'm not going to talk to you about it. 
This is a sports show. Now, occasionally I'll talk about life and fatherhood and parenthood. That's who I am. And I believe it relates to football. But I'm not getting into that stuff. I'm not going into the weeds on there. And that's not who I am. So I'm sorry. I know a lot of you, I don't know why my opinion did matter there. That, that kind of surprised me. But we're not going there. This is sports. We're talking Raiders. We're talking NFL. We're talking things there. That's not what this is for. And I refuse to do that. Appreciate all of you. Thank you for listening today. Remember, the moment, the preparation, and being true to yourself is how you build a sustainable championship franchise. How you build a champion. And I think you got the guy to do it because he's done it. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful day. I'll see you tomorrow.